Hello and welcome to Android Developers Backstage. I am Chet Haas. This week I'm on the Toolkit team. I am Romain Guy. This week I'm also on the Toolkit team. And I'm Tor Norby. I'm always on the Android Studio team. Have uh, you ever done anything besides tools? Developer tools? No. No, I don't plan like to. Like your entire career, every company you've worked for, tools, tools, tools. Yeah, that's what I like okay. doing. Okay. Well, it's not like we've done many different things, Chad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, how but I times, haven't done How many I times have, have you tools? written an animation uh, framework from scratch? Uh, that would be three or four. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What a scam, going from company to company, selling the same thing over and over again, claiming that this time you will get it right. Yes. Yeah. And I never quite do, but maybe that's on purpose, so I get the chance to do it again. Yeah, so we don't actually have a guest today. Um, so today we're going to pull out a topic we've had in our back pocket for a long time. Because this is like, this would be a fun thing to talk about, but then usually we find a guest instead. I would phrase it as Tor has been begging us to do this for a long time. But but how appropriate that we pull something out of the pocket and that something is Lint. That's right. So we're going to talk about Andrew Lint. Uh, you know, I've done a couple of talks on this and just a sub part, like... You know, I think at Kotlin Conf, I talked just about the the original Kotlin Conf. I talked just about the Kotlin part of the analysis, and that was an hour. And this, there's a lot more here, so we couldn't actually cover Lint in one talk. So I'm proud to announce this is going to be a series. Like every week, we're now going to do a rolling. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> I but think we Chad just left the room. <laughs> <laughs> I, I happen to know that Chad also likes Lint, so you know th this is a good one. So we thought we would maybe try to narrow the topic a bit, uh, and so we're going to talk about annotations. So there's a bunch of lint checks for annotations, but the, the critical part is we've added annotations to the Android X library. And then we always make sure we have a lint check to go with it. That's basically enforcing. But, but the whole point of the annotation is to express more about what the code is doing or what the interface or API uh, is expecting of you, right? So the, I think the maybe the best known example of, of these annotations would be the nullness annotations, right? So in Java, because it doesn't have nullness built into the language, uh, you would put at nullable in front of a parameter or maybe on a return value to let people know this parameter can be null. So if you're calling a method that tells you it can be null, you better check for null before you dereference the result. So that, that's a, an example of an annotation. And of course, there's you know um, code analysis in IntelliJ and Android Studio to, to let you know if you made a mistake. Right. And in a way, it's kind of like patching the language, right? Because the compiler doesn't know what those annotations do. There are annotations, obviously, that ship with Java or Kotlin, but the ones we're talking about are not understood by the compiler. So we have to rely on the Lint tool that's part of Studio, but you can also use it outside of Studio, right? Yeah, but like th th that's a very good point. Like the Android APIs were full of documentation that would say in English, this method may be null, right? So uh, so we actually, the tools team added the nullness annotations to the Android APIs originally. And we basically grepped the source code looking for mentions of null and like, oh, here they're saying this is never null, let's put it there. And then you had all the 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 gray areas where it'll say something like, this can be null if something else is true. And you're like, oh, what, how do I annotate this? So instead of RTFM, it's like ETFM, like enforce yep. the FM. It's, it's basically um, making it possible for the tools to reason about it without using all kinds of hacky language, right. regular expression. But it's also a form of documentation, right? Because I find that when I'm in the ID, uh, my fingers know the shortcut. I think it's control J. There's a way to do like a quick lookup. Of Command the, P, yeah. Well, no, because I use probably different settings anyway so you can see the signature of the method that's that's under your carrot uh, and it's nice when you see the annotations you know it's a really quick and easy way to grasp what what the, the method expects yeah it's even used by the documentation generation mm -hmm. tools right so you know the our plugins for the documentation system the the java doclet and now kotlin doclet does look for these annotations and actually extract them into whole English sentences. So we've gone full circle. We went from like looking at handwritten documentation to making an annotation, and now we take the annotation and we actually put in, you know, uh, English fragments into the documentation again. I love handwritten documentation. Like somewhere we have a parchment with Java docs on them. Uh, so I, I was curious. So I was writing some annotations this week for an API I was adding, and I wanted to make sure that this value is bounded between zero and one, inclusive, exclusive, whatever. Um, and I wondered at the time, like how 
guaranteed is the enforcement of that policy. It clearly shows up in the docs, and I know it shows up sometimes as a warning or an error, but are there ways that it can be defeated? Like, can I, as a developer, know that this function will never be called with a value outside of that range? You know, if you really want to shoot yourself in the foot, you turn off lint, and then your code will compile just fine, okay. right? And so, so like the enforcement here is not like the nullness annotations, the Kotlin compiler decided to enforce those as compiler errors. So like you can't compile code, right? If you're violating a nullness contract in Kotlin. It's not like that here. Um, although we do something special in, in Android with Lint. So one thing I, you know, that, that is not clear is that we're talking about Android Lint, but even though it's called Android Lint, it is not Android specific at all. Right, it started as Android Lint, but we made it general purpose for Java, Kotlin, bytecode, XML, uh, and in fact, inside of Google's code base, uh, Lint is now the tool we use for static analysis on all server code, and like so. It's, so again, it's not just for Android. Um, but one thing we've done in Android with the Gradle build system is that we actually run Lint when you build a release binary. Like we don't want to run Lint when you're just building because what you want when you hit run in Studio is for it to go as fast as it can. And you don't necessarily want it to also do extra, a bunch of extra checks. When you're building a release binary, we know it's going to be slow anyway. By default, we're going to run R8 and all these extra shrinking tools and really take our time to make that binary as high quality as it can be. And so for that, we're also running a subset of Lint checks. So you could te technically make sure that your Lint checks are set up to be run as part of that. And then yes, it would break the build during a release binary. Right, but so to, to answer Chad's question, it's what I was alluding to earlier, right? Where there is not a ton of enforcement. So those annotations act, well, you have lint, right? It does some enforcement, but it has limitations. But they also act as a form of documentation and metadata, right? When you're reading code, especially a piece of code that you're not familiar with in the, in the code base, just having those annotations, you know, if you see an array of floats and there's an annotation say, on it saying like, hey, the minimum size has to be nine, right? And if you pass it to a function that says the minimum size has to be three, you know that you're passing the, an array that has the, the, the correct size. So it's just like good to have that extra data. Uh, it's kind of like fencer comments in a way. I, it, it is good, but it, it begs the question, like, should I, as a developer writing platform code, if I want to make sure that nobody's app crashes, then if I have this range thing and if it's not going to tolerate anything outside of that range, does that mean that I should actually have a logic check in the code that says make sure it's in the range? Even though the annotation is sitting right there in the in the you, function call. You need a logic check, yes. Yeah. The annotation okay. is not enough. And and even even if we had more checks, I guess at compile time, you could there are ways you could defeat this I, these, these checks. I think it depends, like it's a trade-off, I think, right? Like I, I think the Kotlin compiler will insert extra null checks for all your parameters. Which is a bit much. I think so too, right? Because yeah, it's the same argument as that, hey, you should enforce it. You should let the user know. But typically, <laughs> if you pass a null to something, it's going to hit that null pointer exception three lines later anyway. And you'll under understand why. And the point is that these checks come with a price. This is runtime overhead. You're adding strings to the string pool. Like, it's binary size, a lot. Yeah. Lots of code. Exactly. So R8 can maybe undo some of it, but I, I feel like you need to think about like what would be the developer experience if this constraint was violated? And I feel like if you're giving them feedback in via Lint, that means that if they're developing with Android Studio, and why wouldn't they? They would, as they're running the code, see that warning and, and usually error. And so they would know. And yeah. so like, I, I don't know if I would actually insert that check. So what, it depends, right? Like one way I think about it is it really depends on the API. If it's an API that I expect to be invoked, you know, in a tight loop at the core of your application, yeah, I won't do the check. I will put the annotations. I will clearly document what's happened, what, what's expected, and what might happen. Uh, but if it's, you know, a constructor that you're supposed to call once, or it's a setup, whatever it is, right? Like then you can have the checks. It's nice to help the developer understand when they make a mistake. Well, especially uh, if it's a likely mistake. And, and I love right. that we started with this example. This is actually my favorite annotation that we have. We're talking about int range, right? Where you can say this integer is, is supposed to be between this and that value. Uh, and that was like, we had these annotations. There's nothing Android specific about it. And this is where people who were Android developers who were using Lint were like, that's awesome, but I don't want that only for my end. I have Java modules and I want the same thing. And so that was kind of the reason why we actually 
made a Gradle plugin that was not part of the Android Gradle plugin to make Lint available for other use cases, right? So, so you make a good point because a very common mistake I've seen developers do with colors, uh, usually there are two types of color representations as integers and the, the different channels, red, green, blue, are values between 0 and 255, so they fit in a byte. And then there's a float representation of numbers where there we tend to use numbers between 0 and yeah. 1. Uh, and I've seen so many times people, you know, on Stack Overflow, on Slack, wherever, say like, hey, I don't understand, like, my color is always white. And then you look at the code, it's like, well, you pass 255 to a float, so, you know, we clamp it to one. So, yeah, it's the maximum. Yeah, this, is the, this is the canonical example we actually added to the documentation for, for int rent, I think. And that is alpha channel. Like alpha yeah. is often zero to 255 and sometimes zero to one. And so it's really like, if you're passing zero, we don't know, like, <laughs> I guess it's fine. It doesn't matter. If you're passing one, you're probably okay, but it'll, you know, it'll not scale well. But if you're passing 255 or 128 or whatever, we know you're passing the wrong kind of thing. And so that's a useful one. And th there's a, there's a cousin maybe of the int range annotation, which is a size annotation, right? This one's used for collections, for example, or arrays where you're saying, I want the length of this array to be you know, maybe exactly this size or maybe between this size and this size. And also it, you can say it's a multiple of. And so if you're passing in something where you're expecting a list of X, Y, Z, you could say, I'm expecting the, 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 the size of this array to be a multiple of three. And then if someone accidentally left one out, they would know immediately that they're having a problem. When I was writing the color space code uh, that's used for color management in Android, uh, there's a lot of functions there that take arrays of floats uh, because you're dealing with colors and we don't want to pass objects and so on. <laughs> and the signature of some of those methods is ridiculous because you get like, you know, you pass two arrays and they both have like at non null, at size, min equals, at float range, you know, and there's more annotations than there is code. Yeah, yeah. But you're getting lint goodness out of it. And, and again, outside of lint, I think, you know, someone who would read the code or just look at the signature gets a very good understanding of the expectations that that code has about the parameters. It's 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 very helpful, you know. It's yeah, there's I, no ambiguity compared to like, you know, the the English uh, documentation if it's there. It's 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 also helping enforce that your code is correct because we don't just apply these annotations to callers of your method. Like if you're saying this method is non-nullable and then we see you passing some returning something nullable we're also going to warn you, right? So, so it's actually it's a bit like contractual programming. Is that what it was called? I forgot the name, but you know, where you're basically like asserting your before and after state. <laughs> we're using this, right, to make sure that your implementation matches what you're promising uh, when we can. Yeah, we also have annotations that I, I find useful and interesting because, for performance reason on Android, we do encode types inside primitives. You know, the most famous example, which is not specific to Android, are colors, right? use an integer, 32 bits, to encode the alpha, red, green, and blue channels. Uh, it's using one byte. And in your code, it can be very easy to forget or not realize what is, you know, what is this integer? Is it an actual integer or is it a color? Or, or you call a method, right? Like, in, is the integer a resource ID? Is, it, is this a color? I've seen, again, many apps make the mistake. And, you know, I don't blame the developers here. That's the problem of, of our APIs and documentation where you call set background and it takes an int, so they pass a color. It's like, no, you're supposed to buy your, pass a resource ID. So we do have or, a notation. Or, vi or vice versa. You, right. you're, you're calling set background r.color.red. That looks correct, right? Like, no. No, it's, because r.color.red is a resource ID and you're supposed to yeah. pass uh, yeah, an ARGB. So we're basically like adding type information to ints. Right, like that's what these annotations are doing. It's saying this is a resource ID, this is a drawable, this is a string ID, or this is actually a resolved color. Or there's some, there's there's some other ones like gravity int, which is saying this is a special meaning of this. This is like it's packing all the the gravity bits, you know, anchoring left, right, and all that stuff. So like px to say that this integer is pixels. It's right? saying it's a dim it's a resolved dimension, right? So if you call get dimension, you pass in a dimension resource, like you know padding, for example, right? Well, now it could either be in pixels or in density independent pixels and so on. So like keeping track of the units for your numbers, again, classic math problem or CS problem, right? You have an int and you're like, you forgot the units, right? And this is basically letting you like pass these ints around without accidentally losing information about what they are. Okay, so implementation detail then, how do you figure this out? Like how does lint, not the annotation thing, but it goes down to lint to actually do the logic of the checks, right? How does it know, oh, this is an integer, but it's not that kind of integer? 
Well, so it's basically, you know, when you make a call to something, right? So you're calling, let's say, set background. The parameter of set background has been annotated with like, I expect, let's say, a color, a color int is what we're calling it. That's also the name of the annotation, right? It means it's it's got the ARGB representation, alpha, red, green, blue representation Roman mentioned. That's what it expects. So we know that the first parameter, first and only parameter to this method is supposed to be one of those. Then we look at the argument you're passing in and we see if we can figure out what kind of int is this. If it points right back to a local parameter and that one's been annotated with like, oh, I'm a color ID, we know that's wrong. Or if we're seeing that you called get resource something like, so, so we're, we, we can complain if we can infer what kind of int you have and it's incompatible with what you're passing. Okay, but if there's there's clearly situations where you will not be able to that's infer right. because if there's whatever. no method like if you're not making any method calls or any annotations, we don't know. We're not doing global analysis for this. Well, yeah. A good example is the add size for arrays, right, or the int range or float range. Uh, you can imagine that short of running the program, sometimes you can't know what values are in those things, and so you can't. So if they're not annotated, that's right. So so you as a programmer can find can can help help lint by annotating more things even in your own code right so if you basically are declaring something that you intend to like if you have a field and you intend to put a color int in that field you might as well annotate it with that and then we will check your assignments later on when you're making some assignment to it right so it's the, the more data you give it the better and so we actually have a hidden feature and it's truly hidden as in it's behind a feature flag we've 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 documented in a few places how you can turn it on but we have this experimental refactoring in studio where we just let it run over the source code and we're inferring annotations so if we see that you're calling something which is saying some that this parameter has to be this well now we know that your argument has to be that as well and so on so we're kind of flowing it backwards and, and making suggestions for for how this works but basically going through and annotating your code not just your public APIs, but with your actual calls will help lint, you know, double check and, and, and give you more diagnostics if things are wrong. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's nice because those annotations, especially with Kotlin now, uh, they become even more helpful. So to go back to the, the example of colors, in Android X dash core, you know, the core KTX library that, that adds a bunch of features to the core Android APIs, we added extension functions to the int type so that you could say, you know, my int color dot red and it does extract the red channel for you. So that if you look at the declaration of that extension function, uh, it does specify that you're supposed to call that on a color int. Um, so if you turn on blint, it should catch when you're not doing that properly. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a whole class of, of, of checks around this. Another one we didn't really talk about, we call them the type def annotations. So this is like int def, long def, and string def. We didn't used to have long versions of these of these uh, annotations, but Kotlin is really picky about type conversions. So, you know... You, Don't get me started, please. <laughs> take a deep breath. <laughs> you, know, get fan. you know, these were annotations were first done when we only supported Java. And so Java typically just upconverts just fine. You specify an int in a, where a long belongs and it'll just upconvert quietly. <laughs> Kotlin does not. So you have to keep calling dot too long, you know, and it was kind of painful to use annotations with them. So we, we have long varieties of all these annotations too. And so the type def annotations lets you say, I'm expecting one of a number of named constants to go here, right? So for example, if you're doing something with a gravity, you might hey, say- it's like an enum. Basically, and this is exactly, this is the 100% of the history, right? Is that the Android team was like, do not use enums. We are using ints everywhere for performance reasons. But it wasn't like they wanted to specify the value two is this, the value three is that. They wanted to say, no, no, use gravity underscore left or gravity underscore right. But there are constants that sound the same, but aren't actually the ones that they're expecting and their values could diverge. And so it's very important to limit your calls to just the allowed constants. And so what the type def annotation lets you say is like, I'm expecting one of these 50 constants to be passed in here. And so if Lint sees any other constant, it's going to complain that this is not one of the valid constants. And it works with flags as well, right? Yeah, there's a special thing you can say that I'm a flag, and then it, then Lint will allow you to do bit masks with these constants. And I think zero is always passed through because it was so common for people to just leave that one out, like as an implicit, like zero means unset or whatever. So we didn't want to complain when we see zero, 
So speaking of complaining, can we complain about uh, bit masking and bit manipulation in Kotlin now? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like specifying the or keyword uh, and the no, it's, so? No, it's the SHR and SHL sure. specifically. Anyway. Yeah, no, it's... Is yeah. it, there's also awkwardness about unsigned like getting access to all the bits that you need in these things as well. Uh, actually, that comes more from Java and the semantics of the of, of the underlying runtime. Um, Kotlin yeah, now has the it's still experimental. I think they have unsigned int and unsigned long, which do help. I mean, they, they don't really do anything for you uh, that you can't do otherwise. Uh, but and and it doesn't help. I just assume that when I'm using a uint. And I'm doing shift right, and there's bits near the top. I'm not going to get the accidental like forwarding of bits with negative numbers, right? right? It's going to propagate the minus. And so I feel like if you really want to live in unsigned space and think about it from your, you, you know, there's assembly. a key, there's a keyword for that, right? There's an unsigned shift in Java. Yeah, it's the triple uh, Chevron. Yeah, and yeah, true. in Kotlin, it's U. It's a, it's S H R, obviously. Yeah, on the unsigned U. shift yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, I don't have unsigned complaints, but I do agree with you that it's a little painful. I'll show you one. Every uh, now and then, I'll do the, the the ampersand repeated to do the the bit masks, and it'll I'll get a syntax error, and I'm like, oh yeah, happens to me all the time. Yeah, I just I do get tired of all the type conversions. Like I know it's a float. I want it to be a float. Stop so this. It's I feel like there are exceptions. They should reword them to be like whoa 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 whoa. Like, so that's, that's the what reason I feel like. why in compose we have this uh, value class called color, right? Uh, that stores your color in a weird way. But it has two functions to construct a color. One takes an int, the other one takes a long. And the reason why we have the version that takes a long is because if you specify a color in your code as a hex constant, so you know 0x, ff, so on, and the alpha channel comes first. So very often you're going to have an opaque color. When Kotlin sees ff, it's like, oh, it has to be a negative number because the top bit is set. Therefore, it cannot be an int. It has to be a long, otherwise it doesn't fit. Uh, and so we create a long version so you don't have to call dot to int every time your alpha value is more than 50% because the top bit is set. Nice. Yeah. API design. Yeah. So the, I think the last of the, let's add type information to int annotations, uh, is the half float annotation. I think that was the first time you and I collaborated on annotation and lint check, yeah. right? Because you were, I think you were implementing half floats or doing Yeah, something? so yeah, it was uh, when I was doing all that color work uh, for some types of color spaces, you bytes, a single byte per channel is not enough. You want more data, uh, but a float is also a little too much. So I added uh, something that's very common in graphics, the concept of half float. So it's a float, it works the same as a float, except it's encoded on 16 bits. And the trick was we were able to introduce color longs and inside the long, because we have 64 bits, we can store the red, green, and blue channels each as a 16 bit float. Uh, and then we have 10 bits left, uh, or no, more than 10 bits. We have 10 bits of alpha and then some bits for the color space. But anyway, so we added that. The problem is that in Java, there are, Java is a little weird with the 16-bit types. There are two of them. There's char, which is unsigned. It's the only unsigned type. Uh, I wish byte was unsigned, but that's a different story. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm going to get mad again. Yeah. Uh, and they're short. So, you know, I decided to use short as the way to represent a, a float, a half float. But again, there was this problem of like, you see short in the code. How would you know that this is not a short, but it's actually a 16-bit float number? So... You added that annotation so we can. Well, you, or I, oh, you, you decided let's not make an object out of this. Yes, <laughs> we want to make an object out of this. Yeah, to that, at least in Kotlin, we, 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 we would use a value class that would yeah. help a lot. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so we have an annotation so that you should put that on your shorts to say, hey, this is a half float. Be careful. This is not a regular 16 bit integer type. And then once that's there, of course, all the tooling can do the enforcement, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so this is actually a, an example where. You know, if you're going to write your own static analysis checks, lint is really good because if you look at what the half float does, it'll not just, it'll warn you when half floats are being combined with other values in dangerous ways, when it's accidentally doing widening, you know, like you're doing this short plus this other thing, suddenly now you have an int, you probably didn't want that, right? You really wanted to make sure that you were combining with some other short, for example, right? And so there's a bunch of support in lint for 
when you have an annotated element, it's being combi- combined with other elements, you know, in, in expressions and so on, you get callbacks as a, as, a, as a lint author. And it's very easy. If you look at the implementation of the half float check, the check itself is really simple. And you look at unit tests and it's doing a lot. And that's because it's sort of lifting on all the, the built-in support for, for annotation-based checks. So, yeah. So, yeah, another annotation that I've used in the past that I found very useful uh, that I assume can't really be checked that well by lint, but again, it goes back to its useful metadata slash documentation. It's the thread annotations, right? Where you can say, this has to run or this will run on the UI thread, on, a, on any thread, on a binder thread. Uh, I forget how many of those annotations we have. There are five. Uh, and one of them is any thread. And that's just a way to say, I'm empty safe. Um, the other four are um, it's worker thread, binder thread, UI thread, and main thread. And even though <laughs> I added those annotations, I do not to this day understand the difference between UI thread and main thread. I, I basically went to Diane Hackboard at the time and got some feedback on it. And I think, Roman, you've explained it a few times. I'm not really- So it. long I'm, story short, most developers don't have to worry about it. Uh, but technically on Android, inside a process, uh, so you have your main thread, that's a UI thread, but you, ha- you can have more than one UI thread. And if you look I, at the implementation of the UI toolkit, in a few places we do things that look strange, and it's because we have to deal with the fact that there might be multiple UI threads, and we can't assume there's only one. I hit this back in in animator days uh, because I had to deal with the same thing, and I I think like there are certain corner cases where like, and then you can have a pop up dialog come up, and now it's a second window in the same process, and I, like so that's not a it second was at thread. least related to that. It's not. Yeah, there, there are two places where really this can happen. One is the system process where we put some of the system UI stuff uh, okay. and that has multiple UI threads. But then inside your process, uh, there is a way for you to declare that multiple apps or packages or APKs are using the same process name. And then in that situation, you could have multiple UI threads. So we have to be careful. And that's well, why- I, I will share a secret now. Uh, in Lint, we treat them as equivalent because again, otherwise we'd probably have some false positives. So like yeah. if something is main thread or UI thread, we're like, ah, this is probably a fine. And it's reasonable because this is something that again, like I said, app developers, especially today, you can more or less safely ignore that. But it's interesting because sometimes we have discussions or contributions to the code and we have to explain like, no, we can't do this because that that will edge case that, you know, yeah. we have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, we have another set of, of annotations for sort of, I think, enhancing the API contract. So one of them is call super. And it's very common in Android, you know, at, at least in the, in the old days, right? When you were overriding, you know, on create, on suspend, on resume and all that, you have to also call super.onCreate. Otherwise, bad things will happen, right? And so the call super annotation is something we sprinkled across all the places where the, the framework expected this. And then when your code is, you know, when we look at your code, if we see that your, your super method is annotated with call super and we don't see you calling it, we will complain loudly. And so this is basically making sure that you do call this method. Uh, and then recently we added another one, which is related, which is saying the super is empty, right? Because we have like Lint's own API surface is full of this. We've created this interface. We use abstract classes generally. And so, you know, we have these methods and we have callbacks for you. It's annoying to have to write super dot something in a callback when really we're declaring as part of the API contract, you know, uh, the super is empty. You don't have to call it. It's just there so we can call you. Uh, and so the empty super lets you say, uh, this, this, this is defined to be empty. And then we will actually tell you this super call is unnecessary. So we can help you get rid of it. So I think those are, those are kind of interesting. So I was remembering some lint checks that, um, your group was trying to add a few months ago, Roma, where um, this is maybe more a thing about lint instead of these annotations, but when does it break down? Like when you, you kind of have to be really clear with any of these rules, like this is exactly what should happen when this code exists. And sometimes it's not that clear. It's like, well, this is probably a bad collection to use in this particular case, but not always. Yeah, th- that's the limit of of things like lint checks uh, or even compilers for that matter. So a good example is we've been trying as part of our efforts of optimizing Compose, we've been you know, chasing allocations, unnecessary allocations that are in the hot path and would 
might trigger garbage collections that you know would affect the app. So we do have collections that are more allocation friendly. And there was this this discussion around like, well, should we have a link check that says always use this new uh, this new collection? Or not really, because it depends on what you're trying to do, right? Like it's not something we want to impose on the caller if it's a public API. Uh, but sometimes we have APIs that are, we have other annotations for that that are public between our modules or you know, it's completely internal. Or maybe it's just a code, code path where it doesn't matter. So like there's no reason to use, you know, a, a different API. This, um, this is kind of getting into the like the the, the fundamentals of, of Lint. Uh, <laughs> it's actually kind of fun history. The 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 origin, I, I, maybe the the predecessor of Lint, was basically written by Romel. Yes, and it was called Layout Opt, I think, and it yes. was a groovy script which 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 went and made a bunch of suggestions about your layout. One of them was like, "Hey, this layout is too deep. You have more than I don't remember ten levels of nesting, and that was just bad for performance." Obviously, there's no like exact number where that is a problem, right? So it was meant to be advice. And Lint itself is kind of, I think, generally following that same school of thought, which is that this is supposed to be someone looking over your shoulder, giving you advice. In some cases, we know that's wrong. And for that, we use errors. But the majority of Lint checks, um, there's about 500 built in and there's a bunch more. Uh, like Android X has his own hundreds of checks now that, that they're bundled. The majority of them are warnings, right? So it's one of those things where we're not sure but this is potentially a problem. We we want to alert you to them so you can make a judgment. And then we have this well, whole- Well, it's to make sure that you thought about it yeah. and you made a judgment consciously and it's not that you didn't stumble upon whatever solution you have. Yeah, and then we have a, a mechanism called baseline, which lets you sort of just like say, fine, I'm going to record. I've looked at all these things. I'm going to record them into this like technical debt file. It's probably a better name than baseline. Uh, that's just kind of recording all the stuff that we've already seen and you've said is fine. And then we'll only tell you about new things we see from now on. So yeah, that is that is a general problem chat where we can't with static analysis be confident in, in the general sense. A good example I run into regularly is, so we do have our own link checks for Compose and then for Android X. Uh, one of them, for instance, is that we want to avoid using arrays in our APIs and we want to favor collections. Uh, and that's great. And most of the time, that is absolutely the right advice. Now, when you're building a graphics API that's dealing with colors, points in the path, you know, vectors, stuff like that, you do not want those collections that will box and unbox. And you want this like fast array. And usually, you want an array. And you want to like tap into like a spe specific offset. And well, so, in that case, you just add, you know, you just add the, the add suppress annotation to tell Lint, no, no, I know what I'm doing in that particular case. Don't tell me that this is wrong because it's not. Yeah, suppression is a, is is an acceptable thing to do and expected, right? I, we have the same issue in our surface where we're turning around and calling a bunch of APIs that are array based, you know. Uh, and so, if you're calling array APIs, you don't want to necessarily force. You know, ever want to wrap it in collections just to, to comply, even if that's that's better practice. Sometimes performance is important, especially on Android. Well, performance, so it can be expectations, right? Like a bitmap is, is literally an array of pixels. It would make no sense to expect. No, no it's a list of ints. <laughs> Sorry. List of integer. List of big integers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's situational, and and yeah, there, there's no good answer. Uh, and I think the decision how we decide to turn something into a link check is the advice has to be applicable enough that it makes sense yeah. to turn it on always. Otherwise, you know, again, we do have a few link checks that we use for our own needs. Like for instance, in the compose code base, like one I added was <laughs> if you use a for loop in Kotlin and you use the step keyword it dramatically changes the code that's generated. You go from an actual for loop that in the bytecode looks like, you know, it's it's a comparison and a go-to to something that allocates an int range, an int progression, there's a while loop, there's an iterator. We don't want that in our code base. So we have a link check for that, but it's for us. We're not making you go through that. Like, I, I think one of, the, one of the situations I was remembering was it was a bad combination of it was not a hundred percent situation. Like sometimes you wanted to do this other approach instead. And so it was spitting out a lot of false warnings, but also the, 
the way to do it in a more performant way was not straightforward. So it couldn't simply give you an error saying, replace this with that. Right. And yeah, so the, it was like a really of, verbose, unclear error, and it wasn't 100% Yeah, correct. the solution, unfortunately, is to write a, a while loop and with a stack var, uh, which is no... Uh, yeah, no we, the Kotlin developers, when they see a var instead of a val, they, they're not, they feel <laughs> weird. Yeah, we have a number of lint checks in this. You know, one was added for Android X, actually. I, I don't remember exactly, but I think it was something about synthetic methods. You know, if you have an inner class and you have some members that you're accessing from the outer class, the compiler will insert a bunch of extra trampoline methods so that the class is able to touch them, but your method stays private. So there's like a little secret contract. This actually costs method handles. And until I think it's no longer as big of an issue in Android, maybe it's gone at this point with multidex, but it used to be that you had this 64K method limit. And so we were afraid to burn up that budget. And so the, the, the work runs to make these fields public to avoid this. This is, this is a bad practice. But again, some people really care, like Android X cared. And so we had a lint check for this, but that lint check was off by default. So the idea is we have these performance checks that are really nitpicky and we let you opt into them if you care. Now, we also have this flag, which is like turn on all warnings. And, and, and some of our users are like, well, I want my code to be beautiful. So I'm going to turn on all warnings by default. And so they're being exposed to a lot of these like, you know, micro optimization checks too. Uh, so, you know, part for the course. That's when you create a baseline. Uh, yeah. So it's interesting you mentioned uh, making things public uh, because there's the synthetic method problem and then sometimes there's also especially in Kotlin with the concept of properties where you know when you declare a property whether or not you're going to access the field directly or method uh, depends on a lot of things uh, and sometimes you know again for highly optimized code that as an app developer you don't need to worry about but when we build the collection that's used deep inside the runtime of Compose we very much care about that so sometimes we have to make things public or internal or whatever uh, just for code generation. Uh, and one of the things we have, one of the tools that we have is this at restrict to uh, annotation. Uh, Tor, can you explain how this works exactly? Because I've used it. I know the effects, but I don't know how it's <laughs> enforced or... Yeah, so restrict to is basically saying, I have some restrictions on callers. And this, this uh, annotation actually takes a parameter where you describe the kind of constraint you have. And so a very simple one, um, I don't know how widely it's used, but it can say, you know, you're only allowed to call this from subclasses, right? Because uh, in some cases, because of the way Java packages work, you want to make something public, but it's really, you know, you're, you're kind of cheating a little bit. And so you want subclasses to be able to have access to it, but not other classes. You know, the, the Java protected uh, modifier is not just for subclasses. It's also for anyone else in your package. Mm -hmm. Right, So like it doesn't, even though you think it's for subclasses, it has this other visibility that you don't intend. So this annotation lets you say, actually, I really want you to enforce subclasses. And the most commonly used one would be tests. You're saying this method can only be called from, from tests. And this is actually an alias for visible for testing, which we also have, right? So you're just saying like, uh, I'm happy, I, you know, I happen to make this method publicly visible, but it's because this test needs it. That's in a different package. Um, you know, and, and then the, the one that I think Roman was talking about is you can say, I want to restrict this method to my own library. And that's the one where, you know, inside of Android X, we, you know, you, you may want some sibling. It's like the old C++ friends concept, right? Where you're saying like anyone who's in the same Maven namespace as me get to call this. But this is really dirty implementation code that we don't think of as API. Uh, but it has to be publicly visible for these other... Or, or not necessarily dirty, but recently I did that for a, a collection that's very specific. It's an interval tree. It's very useful for what I was doing uh, in a few places in Compose, but it's not generic enough that we should put it in AndroidX.collection. So we could create a separate library in AndroidX containing only you know, this kind of private collections and use it as an implementation dependency of Compose, or... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, most of the places I see this, it's like it's for a class that's actually exposed, but there's a few fields in there. You're like, don't mess with this or, or a method that the your library needs for bookkeeping, but you do not want anyone else to... to yeah, and it's not just us. I think it was Jesse Wilson who recently wrote a blog post. Uh, there, there is a way in Kotlin, I always forget uh, on how to do this when you use internal to still access the internal. There's a, a few suppressions that you can 
put in place in your code that will let you do this. Uh, yeah, internal is special because this is Kotlin's same attempt to do this, and they use like name mangling, but it has to be in the same compilation invocation kind of. And sometimes with some build systems, they're not. You know, the tests are compiled separately from the main class. And so now you no longer can use internal because, well, not same compilation uh, invocation. All right. So you've talked about doing very specific, like both lint checks as well as annotations for Android X for internal stuff because of the amount of code that we're writing. Theoretically, people listening to this might also be writing a bunch of code and writing their own internal libraries. Um, and maybe they have code that they want to write checks for. I assume all this stuff, hey, Android is open source, is something that external people could write their own checks for as well. Is that some combination of like, well, you need to write a lint check and then here's how you write an annotation? Like, how do people do this yeah, from the uh, outside? There are, the code? One, of the, one of the nice things here is that you can actually write lint checks for your own library. And the way that the 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 Android libraries work is you know they come with extra payload, so you get the library code, but you also get resources, and you get like manifest merging stuff, and you get lint checks. And so when you're using a library, you can also supply lint checks to be enforced with that. And so that's what Android X is doing. So when you depend on Compose, you're getting a bunch of Compose checks written by the Compose team, not the Studio team. You can also just write pure lint checks yourself. And so Slack has written a a set of lint checks. I think they're up to like nearly a hundred checks now. Right, and so that's just a, a, a collection you opt into in your build, and you're saying, "Give me the Slack checks," and now those are those are also enforced in your source code, right? So people people can do this, and people people do this, and they're not the only ones. There are other um, libraries as well that do yeah, this. Yeah, and how you write lint checks is, uh, I think, what you are saying would take a few episodes to explain. Uh, there's a lot to unpack there. Uh, there are many ways. Like, I'm, uh, I'm going to give a uh, talk at KotlinConf this yeah. year about it, but and it's going to focus just on Kotlin. When I wrote one, uh, it can be intimidating because again, there are there are several ways of doing things, and it's complicated because you're 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 uh, you're looking at the the AST of, of the code uh, in many ways. Uh, but if you look at the source code of existing lint checks, if you find a lint check that's very similar to what you're doing, start from there. Uh, a lot of lint checks are pretty trivial. Um, some of them gets more difficult. Like the one I was writing about the, the you know, adding step inside the loop was more complicated because you have to look, it's more about the syntax than method calls or just looking at annotations. Uh, but a lot of the lint checks are Yeah, there's, are like, there's a learning true. curve to understand what an abstract syntax tree is and like, yeah. well, how is a property represented? You know, it could be a little hard, but once you get the hang of it, it's very fun. I yeah. think Chet recently ran into some sort of bug, right? You spent a few hours debugging something with a colleague looking over your shoulder and, and you finally discover what the problem was and you're like, hey, we should have a lint check. So this was not annotation based, right? But you know, like it took me half an hour to write the lint check, yeah. right? But this was something that an engineer had spent, multi like a very, very good engineer, had spent multiple hours scratching their head, trying to figure out, right? And once we sort of get these patterns, it's actually very simple often, not right. always, but very simple to write a, a lint check, which is then like flagging it. And then the exciting part is running on this existing code base and finding violations. But in some cases, what I found was not difficult, uh, but forces you to think differently is that you're, you're dealing with source code. So when you're looking at the, the, the syntax tree, so again, if I take my example of a, of, a, of a for loop, right? You write for i in 0 dot dot 10. Well, most of the time, that's how people write their for loop. But they could write 0 dot dot a function call, or they could write open parenthesis, an expression, close parenthesis, dot, dot, open parenthesis, you know, and suddenly like your lint check has to handle all those types of expressions and deal, and you know, and the EST, like you see the parenthesis, you see like the left operator and the right operator. You, and the, now you've really done it, you can set me off here, because one of my favorite <laughs> topics, like one of the things I think is really good in lint is the testing framework. Yes. Uh, and one of the things it does, it has something called test modes. So it takes your existing unit tests and they are checked in as like descriptors. So you're saying, here's my test, here's like a Kotlin snippet, here's some manifest, and here's some other stuff. And then, so you're passing this to Lint, and it'll run it, and it'll check that when you analyze this, you get the expected list of, of warnings. But then it'll run through these extra test modes. So one of them is- it you fuzzing. Yeah, it, yes, it basically inserts parentheses in every legal place that it can, and it makes sure you're still identifying the same errors. It'll take every like if statement in Java and convert it to when to make because those are actually different representations in the AST. It'll insert white space everywhere and make sure your quick fixes aren't like hard coded for certain kinds of things. And there's you know there's there's a bunch of these uh, even internal ones. So internally, you know, we want to make sure that we work with both like pre Android X and post Android X. 
that's not something we we worry about externally, but internally we we sort of convert all the namespaces to and run the test again. So so this this thing that you're mentioning is absolutely a problem, and I'm sure we're not catching everything, but we're trying to sort of automate that because it is it is true that when you're doing looking for code patterns, developers have a lot of possibilities in how they can vary how they express something. And and in the lint the lint code base, there's a lot of utilities that that deal with that for you to some extent. So that's why like look at existing lead chunks, uh, see yeah. what they're doing. Like one of them, you know, was when Kotlin came around, was named parameters. You know, a lot of lint checks would just assume like, well, the third argument to this method is going to be the width and the fourth is the height. Well, no, with like with Kotlin, you can say height equals five, width equals 10. And then suddenly there are parameters and there's default parameters. So you're dropping some, like mapping the arguments to a method to the actual parameters is tricky and so that's that's kind of built in um but yeah there's there's a lot to think about um, but it's very fun so i was curious you were reminding me tour of the the um check that you wrote it was just like three or four weeks ago it was something that came up in the shapes code i can't remember the situation but i was curious i, I can because it, oh, like, yeah. it was a good example that would be great. yeah so yeah. so i was curious what it was and i was also curious what you found when you ran it on the source base yeah. So, uh, so the 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 issue Chet had was he was calling build list, which is a Kotlin DSL for building a list. And inside that build list, he was constructing his object that he wanted added to the list. Now in Kotlin, I'm sorry, in in Compose, that's how you do stuff. You kind of like put the object right inside the lambda, and that's the thing that's being built. The build list API doesn't work like that. You have to actually call add. So inside build list, you have to call add, and then the thing you're adding. He was basically just to creating an object and throwing it away. Just and build list was happening them on the stack. Yeah, build list was happy to like, okay, cool, you've built this thing, we're not going to throw it away, right? So the fix, the, the lint check there is just looking for build list calls and making sure that you're calling add somewhere on the objects. Now, you could do computations inside a build list, so it's not like you're allowed to do other things than just calling add, right? But we want to see at least one add call. And so that was a very simple uh, uh, check. And so when I ran this on the existing studio code base looking for positives, I found false positives, right? Where I had not realized there's a different add method that we also have yeah. to look for. You can call like, I forgot now, add all or something. A couple of other annotations to mention. We we talked about call super and, you know, uh, empty super and, um, and, re and and return this. And so another one that's related is open for testing. Uh, actually, I don't, I don't think we talked about return this, but return this is one of those things when you have a builder and every builder method is supposed to be returning this so you can chain them. Yeah. Return this, you can annotate that so that if someone is accidentally nice. returning something else, well, that, that's dodgy. And and open for testing is basically saying, I'm in Kotlin and I made this thing open. So you can subclass. So it's, it's kind of like visible for testing's friend, right? Where you're saying like, I had to make this open, but only tests are allowed to subclass me, right? That's what that's for. Um, you know, when we talk about Lint, time just flies. <laughs> I feel like we've been going for five minutes and I'm looking like, oh, you know, we probably have to wrap up soon. Any other annotations that either one of you want to talk uh, about? No, I think we, we, I mean, we're not going to go through every single annotation. I think we should do another episode to talk about how Lint actually works. I'm particularly curious about how do you make it fast or at least fast enough. Oh yeah, there's a uh, lot of work on that. Yeah, I can imagine, especially because you, you also don't control like how expensive a single Lint check can be and they're, they're all going to do like repeated work um, anyway yeah so it tries very hard not to do that uh, don't uh, answer right now we're gonna do that in the next in the no, but we, we've got a couple hours let's let's get into it um <laughs> it's lunchtime i'm hungry <laughs> i'm french you can't take lunch away from me i, I there's one more, a couple of more i want to throw out there one is discouraged um this is basically you know we kept getting requests from the framework like can you write a link check that says not to use this api it's not quite deprecated, but we want to explain why it's discouraged. So we just added an annotation for that. Like, so you can, you can, if there's an API you don't want people to use, you can put at discouraged on it. And so that's what we- <laughs> At so, considered so harmful. You, yeah, I, I'm disappointed you didn't uh, name it uh, at deprecated kind of. <laughs> <laughs> we should do that. You know, there's a lot of these little Easter eggs in the, in the, yeah. in the framework. We should add one of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, we can't go to the whole list. I, th I think basically what you want to do is go to the Android X dot annotation package. Uh, it's full of annotations. Now, there's a whole bunch we there, you know, basically all the resource types in Android, there's a long list like strings, layouts, menus, navigation, bools, styleable. I could keep going, right? There's one for each of them. So all the annotations that end with res are basically just meant to say, I am a resource ID of the corresponding type. 
That's what they're for, right? So so it's it's the API package is going to have like 30 classes that are like, uh, you know, but they kind of make it look even more intimidating. Skip all of those. Um, but the rest are... So now Chet and I are going to go back to work and Tor will give you a... We'll do a dramatic reading of the, <laughs> of the annotations. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. No, I like I've done a couple of talks on Lint and each time I try to talk about a small subset and still like... You know, I, I was at a conference in Prague where I was basically like pushed off the stage uh, because, you know, the, there was a misunderstanding about how much time I had. You know, I've that, never that been wasn't to... the reason, Tor. <laughs> Maybe not. I've never been to Tor's house, but I wonder if he has one of those label makers and he puts annotations on everything in his house, like <laughs> at do not open, you know, at leaky faucet. <laughs> Chat's Ben. Do I have that? Uh, no comment. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this was fun for me. Uh, and uh, you know, the best part is I feel like we still have, uh, uh, you know, some related stuff in our pocket for whenever we don't get a guest again, right? right. There's more stuff to, to cover here. Um, if you have any questions about any of this or suggestions or complaints uh, or requests for annotations or new lint checks, whatever. Or if you would like to know how some of those things work in more detail, like, you know, if you have suggestions on, on what we should talk about, like, let us know. Yeah, yep. go to the go to the YouTube channel for the Android Developers Backstage podcast. Um, that's where we're trying to collect them. And leave a um, comment. Yes. Yeah. Right. And subscribe and click the bell. And like, sorry, I'm trying to be a YouTuber right now. Uh, cool. Well, cool. Um, I, I guess this would be the time for me to mention. So speaking of annotations, um, I after this week, we can attach the at deprecated annotation to me. Um, so, so I, would that be at discouraged or at deprecated? <laughs> at removed? At removed? At removed. I don't know. At, at gone? Something like that. Um, so I think I mentioned on a previous podcast, I'm out in Chicago going to school. And it turns out that going to school full time is not compatible with also working full time. Um, so something's got to give. And I'm going to move on after almost 14 years on Android. So I wanted to mention it here because Android community people uh, tend to tune into this thing. Um, and I've enjoyed being part of that community. And I guess I still will be, but not from inside. And can you like officially confirm that it like Gradle and Lint had nothing to do with it? Uh, I, I, again, I cannot comment on that. Okay. Uh, my lawyers advise me not to get into that discussion here in public. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be clear, he's joking. <laughs> <laughs> they are my best friends, all of them. Uh, yeah, so yes. the homework load was basically too big to, to carry. Um, Remember homework? It, uh, there's tons of homework, um, and the homework is not too much. It's more like if I actually also want to sleep, um, then it, it gets a little bit tricky. Oh, that's your mistake right there. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's a wrap. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everyone, and uh, keep those comments, comments coming. And we'll do another one on this. Yeah. Sounds, Sounds good. good to me. Thanks. Thanks.